The old song, Breaking Up is Hard to Do, is 100% correct. You can almost hear that song right now. But when it comes to the NHL, they have some horrible breakups. Look at Buffalo and Jack Eichel right now. But there's been many, many other ugly breakups. Patrick Waugh in Montreal. Eric Lindros, twice. It's just a fact of life. All relationships come to an end. Whether it's Mark at his prom date, the NHL in Atlanta, or the Toronto Maple Leafs in the Stanley Cup. So today, Big Apple Hockey is ranking our worst breakups in NHL history. Phil Esposito was a great center for the for the Boston Bruins. Esposito had this illustrious career of the Bruins, Stanley Cup champion. But in the mid-70s, his production started to decline, but Espo didn't want any part of that. So, what happened was, one night, Don Cherry, Bobby Orr, went to his hotel room. Told him, uh, Phil, you want to sit down? You've been traded. And Phil Esposito said, I can't believe this fucking shit. He promised me. Harry Sinden shook my hand and promised me I would never leave as long as he's there. And I said, and I gave up all that fucking money in the WHA. And now you're telling me I'm trading. And if you tell me I got traded to the New York Rangers, I'm going to jump out that fucking window. And he turned to Bobby and he said, Bob, open the window. At that time, the New York Rangers were having a bit of an identity crisis. They were eliminated by the Philadelphia Flyers, and they wanted to get tougher. That kind of sounds familiar. So the Rangers hmm. ended up trading for Phil Esposito. And, uh, and Carol Vadney, and they sent back Jean Rattel and Brad Park. Uh, a lot of people will tell you that was a mistake, even though Espo would be a contributor to the Rangers making Stanley Cup Finals in 1979. Um, for the most part, a lot of these, these breakups have been bad blood between the player and the organization with, you know, either holdouts or, or bad words exchanged. Um, that didn't happen with John Tavares and the Islanders. That was, it's more so between Tavares and the Islander fans. John Tavares was eligible to sign an extension July 1st, 2017. He didn't do it. He said, you know, he, he wanted to, you know, take his time. He wasn't in a rush. My my opinion, hindsight's 2020, but realistically, the Islanders should have just traded him then because that was a red flag um, right there that he wasn't signing on the dotted line the minute he was able to. But... The fact is that since that moment, after that, time and time and time and time again in the media, he he ran his mouth and he said how much he loved it on the island, how he wanted to stay. Um, that's his intention. He loves it here, yada, yada, yada. I know, yeah, what is a player going to say? But you know what? Look at what Artemi Panarin did. Sergei Bobrovsky. What Seth Jones just did with Columbus said, hey, listen, at the end of the year, when I'm eligible, I'm not re-signing with you. That's the route he should have took. He should have just been a man, and stepped up and said, hey, look, I'm not really sure about it, um, where I stand, and be honest. And then the Islanders could have traded him. They could have got something for him. But instead, you know, he did the opposite and doubled down on how much he loved it. And that is why Islander fans have so much hate towards him. A lot of fans are like, oh, I don't care. He was a free agent. He had his right. They don't understand that. It's not that he left. It's how he left has been the problem with Islander fans since this all unfolded. Simply just should have just told the truth. And no matter what you want to believe, you, some, some people say that, yeah, which we reported, we've heard that he was close to re-signing with the Islanders and that he didn't that he didn't start to think about actually leaving until he met with Toronto and then, you know, he just got swayed by them. But there's also a lot of people mostly I'm the fans that believe that he had his mind made up a long time ago that he wanted to play with Toronto um, and that the whole dog and dog and pony show LeBron James esque how he met with five teams out in California was just all for show just so you know it wasn't completely obvious that he wanted to play for Toronto but all he had to do was just say tell the truth just simply said, I'm not really sure what I'm going to do. And this would have all played out differently. And which is why Islander fans call him the snake. Because they believe he deceived them with his words. <laughs> While we're on the topic of snake <laughs> and just tell the truth, Mike Keenan. 
The New York Rangers had Mike Keenan coach them for one season, and it was after one of the most disappointing seasons in the franchise history. After winning the President's Trophy in 1992, the Rangers would finish dead last in 1993. And then Mike Keenan showed up. He brought them discipline. He brought them a President's Trophy. And you can see the change in the team as they were the number one team in the league for, the, for most of the season, pretty much from November to the very end. So what happens? The Rangers blow out the Islanders in the first round. They blow out the Capitals in the second round. They have a difficult series against the New Jersey Devils, but they move on to the Stanley Cup Finals. And what does Mike Keenan do in the Stanley Cup Finals? He negotiates with two different teams to get out of town, and he was in a power struggle with Neil Smith. No, that's not what you should be doing. The Rangers haven't won a Stanley Cup in 54 years. You could put your 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 petty squabble away for about two more weeks but no keenan had to do that and as a result detroit was fined uh twenty five thousand dollars the blues were fined fifty thousand dollars and had to give up peter nedved as compensation so thank you mike you get you got us a cup but did you really get us a cup because you were you were tr you already had a foot out the door well, this was, this was ugly. Um, Alexei Yashin sat out the entire 1999-2000 season with the Ottawa Senators. The year prior, he had 94 goals. Sorry, 94 points, 44 goals. Um, and really established himself as an elite player with the Ottawa Senators. Um, even the year before that, he scored 33 goals. But he was in the final year of his contract, which is paying him $3.6 million. Alexei Yashin, after having the season he did, he wanted to be paid, he wanted to renegotiate his contract, and he wanted to be paid between 11 and $12 million um, as per his agent, Mark Gandler. Now, Alexei Yashin was firm on that, did not budge, sat out the whole year. Um, the Ottawa Senators ended up suspending him in November of that season for the rest of the season, and they played without him. Now, Ottawa at the time, they couldn't they couldn't pay him that much money. Um, they actually had, they actually tried to, funding from the province of Ottawa to even come up with that kind of money to pay Alexei Yashin, but that wasn't feasible. And Alexei Yashin was sticking to his guns. During the whole year he sat out, he was he was skating over in Switzerland, practicing with a team um, called the Flyers. And back home, though, he was still refusing to play for them, even the following year. But the Ottawa Senators actually had to take him to arbitration because they believed that he still owed them a year of service. So the Arbitrator ruled that Alexei Yashin did indeed owe the Ottawa Senators another year. So after not playing in the 99-2000 season, he ended up coming back begrudgingly and played for Ottawa before he was infamously traded to the New York Islanders for Bill McCult, to Daniel Chara, and a first-round pick, which turned out to be Jason Spezza. Thanks, Mad Mike, for that one. But <coughs> It happens all the time. Tensions had been extremely high between Buffalo Sabres goaltending legend and all-time great Dominic Hasek and Ted Nolan, the coach. So it got to a point that later in the season in the playoffs, uh, they were facing the Ottawa Senators in 1997. And Hasek did not want to play, supposedly. He claimed that he felt the twinge in his knee and was unfit to play. Um, there are many Sabres fans, even pundits, who doubt that still to this day. And the whole situation basically broke down from there. Um, Hasek and John Muckler, who won General Manager of the Year in 1997, kind of took one side against Ted Nolan and the other. Um, it ended up, this whole divorce ended up with not only Nolan being fired, but John Muckler himself being fired and Darcy Regier taking over. Yeah, Dominic Hasek did not play uh, for a while against the, the Senators in that series. He missed a large chunk of that series. Um, and he missed all of the Flyer series. And Steve Shields actually performed brilliantly for the Sabres, but he just was not good enough to beat the Philadelphia Flyers. This is one of the most controversial divorces in all of sports history. Well, this one, Eric Lindros was, pro at this time, 
he was really the highest touted player since coming out of the entry draft since probably Mario Lemieux in 1984. Um, but he was touted as the next one. Um, and he had made it, the controversy started when he made it clear that to the Quebec Nordiques that he would not play for them if he was drafted by them, which is mostly driven by his father. His father did not want him to play in Quebec. Um, Eric Lindell said later stated that he had nothing against the, you know, the, the French area, the province, but it was more so his dad did not want him to play for Quebec. The Quebec Nordiques drafted him anyway, first overall in the 1991 NHL draft. Um, and Lindros did not play in the NHL until 92-93, as he held firm on his stance not playing for the Nordiques. Um, he was traded, and probably, aside from the Gretzky trade, you would say, um, the biggest trade in NHL history. I mean, he was traded to the Flyers for, you know, everything in the kitchen sink. I mean, you're talking Chris Simon, Mike Ricci, Kerry Huffman, Ron Hextall, Duchesne, uh, sorry, Peter Forsberg, Steve Duchesne. Two, round, two first round picks, future considerations, and cash. So, as you can see, it was a really, really, really large return with the Flyers getting Peter Forsberg, who is going to be a Hall of Famer. Um, so, it ended up all right for them. But it was unprecedented. We hadn't seen anything like this where a guy gets selected first overall, who's supposed to be the next Gretzky, refuses to play for the Quebec Nordiques organization. Um, and it was, it was, like I said, it, it was ugly. He really held firm on it. I mean, this was almost like a, to some extent, like an Eli Manning situation with the Chargers. You know, it's very rare you see a player get drafted by a team and refuse to play for him. But I, I think overall it worked out for both teams. The Nordiques ended up winning a Stanley Cup as the, as the Colorado Avalanche about five years later. Um, Windros went on to have a good career with the Flyers. Um, it didn't win a cup, but I would say it worked out for the most part for all teams involved. Mark Messier came to the New York Rangers for one reason and one reason alone, to deliver the Stanley Cup to New York. In his first season, he won the president uh, he won the President's Trophy or led the Rangers to a President's Trophy and won his second Hart Trophy for league MVP. In 1994, he delivered on his promise, and he won the New York Rangers their first Stanley Cup in 54 years, and their only one since 1940. Now, Messier spent an additional three more seasons with the New York Rangers. Uh, he would score his 500th goal against Rick Tabarachi and really cement his legacy for his Hall of Fame career. And in 1996, Wayne Gretzky signed with the New York Rangers. And the Rangers had a one-two punch and made a deep playoff run. Came up short against the Philadelphia Flyers, losing in five games. And in the final minute of the, uh, game five, John Davison said negotiations could be a funny thing, and this could be Mark Messier's last shift as a New York Ranger. Little did any Ranger fan know he was right. It was a contentious contract negotiation all the way through with Vancouver and Edmonton trying to woo Messier back to the Pacific Northwest, which eventually Vancouver would do. But the worst was when MSG president Dave Checkets came out and said, how long do I have to pay for the 94 Cup? Kind of a harsh thing to say. And you know what? Messier had said, I'm going to Vancouver. It produced one of the best returns where it was uh, the first time since Eddie Jockerman returning that the fans really wholeheartedly just embraced the away team. Now, Messier would not have a good tenure in Vancouver and would return to the New York Rangers eventually. But that breakup in 1997 really still stings Ranger fans. If you talk to almost any Maple Leafs fan, they'll probably say three words when it comes to Harold Ballard. Rot in hell. And this all started with a strained relationship between Daryl Sittler and Harold Ballard and that also included future Ranger head coach, Roger Nielsen. So uh, the players were firmly a fan, firmly fans of Roger Nielsen. Roger Nielsen was a player's coach. But Harold Ballard was not the biggest fan of Roger Nielsen. Roger Nielsen had actually had been fired and brought back a couple of times. And 
Due to this, it caused even more strain between Sittler and Ballard. Um, Ballard even ended up hiring uh, Punch Imlock as a general manager in 19. 19- he ended up having Lanny McDonald, who was Daryl Sittler's best friend and line mate, traded uh, because Daryl Sittler was one of the early pioneers of the NHLPA along with Alan Eagles. And basically, it comes down to the fact that Ballard was against any type of players union. Sittler was more than outspoken about it, and he wanted to get more rights for players. And Sittler was right in doing so. But Ballard, being the Scrooge that he was, tried to sabotage that. So because Daryl Sittler had a no trade clause in his contract, he was one of the earliest players to have one. He said that he wouldn't waive his no trade clause for any less than $500,000. Now, around 1980, that's a lot of money for that time period. A lot of money. Players are not really making $1 million yet. That That's a lot. That's like a year's worth of salary for most players in the NHL, if not all of them. And this was a, a slap in the face. Um, so he sent them, not only did he trade Lanny McDonald, but he traded him to the Colorado Rockies to further, to further kind of bolster this. Ballard actually was quoted as saying that he likened Sittler's actions to burning the Canadian flag. Um, they tried to patch things up afterwards, but it ended up not working. Uh, Punch Imluck ended up getting a a second heart attack, and he had to step down. There was a new general manager that came in named Jerry McNamara, and they looked to trade um, Daryl Sittler to the Minnesota North Stars. But that did not happen, and he ended up being traded in January of 1982 to the uh, Philadelphia Flyers. So one of the longest and most drawn-out divorces uh, uh, probably the most drawn out divorce in this entire list happens to be this one early in the season the canadians hired mario tremblay wa and tremblay had a strained relationship from when they roomed together when he played the story was that tremblay would kind of mock wa's english speaking capabilities um and they just from that from that point on they had a rocky relationship there was some reports that they almost got into a fight actually on long island in 1995 um, but the story goes, it was a game against the Detroit Red Wings. They lost 11-1. Patrick Watt allowed nine goals on 26 shots before he was finally pulled. So, which he obviously was not happy about. At that time, there was no, there was no glass behind the bench as the Canadians, like ownership group and management would sit right behind the players. So Watt stormed past his coach after he got pulled and said to the Canadians president, that it's the last game he's ever played for the Montreal Canadiens. The next day, the Canadiens suspended him, and four days after that, he was traded. Um, they got Andre Kovalenko, Martin Brzezinski, uh, and there was another piece in that deal, but it was Juan Joey Keane going to the Colorado Avalanche. Jocelyn, oh, Tebow. Jocelyn Tebow. Yeah, Jocelyn Tebow. Um, went to the Avalanche, and Juan ended up winning two cups after he left, once in 96, which is... Colorado's first year there after moving from Quebec and then again in 2001. And this situation was just so raw because he was literally so irate that after he gets pulled, he immediately said last time he's ever played for the organization. And he was true to his word. That was the last time he ever played for the Canadians. You know, we're talking about a goalie who it's not like he just risen to success with Colorado. He was a, a wildly successful goalie with the Canadians, um, you know, prior to that trade. And the Canadians... If you look, if you really look back on it, you kind of say what would have what would have been if Wa would have stayed stayed on Montreal. Um, you know, Colorado probably doesn't win a Stanley Cup. Um, you know, and maybe the Canadians would have won more um, aside from their win in 1993. And maybe they, with Wa, they would have won off one more. But um, very disrespectful to a guy like Patrick Wa to leave him in to get embarrassed. Uh, Trombley knew what he was doing, um, and frankly. You know, it was a Bush League remover from a pro sports organization. No matter how you feel about a guy, you don't like him. Um, you don't leave, a, you know, an elite goaltender in to get embarrassed in that situation. 
Um, maybe if there was no hate between the two guys, it wouldn't have went on and wouldn't have happened like that. But since there was bad blood, um, it just escalated into what happened. And, you know, Patrick Waugh, one of the best ever, went on to cement himself, um, you know, in Colorado as, you know, one of the best, if not the best goalie of all time. But here are some honorable mentions. Breakup of all breakups. Eric Lindros was a very polarizing figure from his very, not even his very first day in the NHL, but even before that. By the time he was drafted, he was already a, a polarizing figure, stating that he wouldn't play for the Quebec Nordiques. Um, the background on it is that Eric's agent, which was also his father, Carl, and his mother, Bonnie, were very involved in Eric's career. Behind the scenes things, um, management, agency, handling his finances and everything, they got involved to a point where Eric had gotten some concussions, uh, something that had haunted him because back in junior days, he skated with his head down. And if you, anybody who's ever played hockey, you know, the one thing that you don't do is skate with your head down. You, back then, you would get your head taken off if you did that. And Eric did. Darius Kasparitis was the first concussion that Eric Lindros received back in 1998. Others came after. Others followed. Hal Gill, uh, Scott Stevens, Jason Doe. There, I mean, there's a laundry list of guys who gave Eric Lindros a concussion at one point in his career or another. Mark Smith in San Jose with his first season in, with the New York Rangers gave him a, a mild concussion. Um, there are very few players in the history of the game that skated with their head down like Eric did. That caused Eric to get several concussions. And these concussions created a strained and severed relationship between him and the Flyers. Back then, concussions were kind of an afterthought. CTE was years away from being discovered. Uh, there was really no information on how just how bad it actually was for a player. Um, players who basically had warped lives and minds after their pro careers, it wasn't attributed to concussions or CTE. There was no information about that yet. Eric Lindros knew this, however, um, had spoken with his doctors and was unhappy with the Philadelphia Flyers team doctors and their diagnoses. Also, Eric Lindros in Nashville actually suffered a collapsed lung. And if it wasn't for Keith Jones, Eric Lindros might be dead today because they wanted to, him to get on a plane and fly back to Philadelphia to be seen by the team's doctors. Keith Jones said that he would basically fight anybody that would try to put him on that plane because he was going to die due to air pressure, and he would have. So between these events, the relationship got worse and worse. Verbal jabs were exchanged. Bobby Clark, then general manager of the Philadelphia Flyers, called Eric Lindros soft. Um, Eric's parents, Carl and Bonnie, sent verbal jabs at the organization and this blew up into what we're almost looking at right now with the jack eichel situation but even worse 20 years ago so when i say that the jack eichel situation is going to turn into eric andros 2.0 it's this close to doing it this is the worst breakup i i've probably ever seen in the history of sports i i've never seen anything like this and I don't think there will ever be anything like this ever again. Lindros ended up holding out for the 2000-2001 season. A little further context, Lindros, the same package that was sent to Philadelphia for Lindros, the Rangers had almost completed a trade for Yarmir Yager. Now, that completed a, I would say, a year and a half, maybe even longer, saga in which the nastiest divorce that I've seen in sports history. 
If you like that video, we got a lot more. So check out any of these that are right over here. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Your ideas are intriguing to me, and I wish to subscribe to your newsletter.